The Man-Eating Tree by Phil Robinson. This is a LibriVox recording. Preliminary Note Before committing this paper to the ridicule of the great mediocre, for many, I fear, will be inclined to regard this story as incredible, I would venture on the expression of an opinion regarding credulity, which I do not remember to have met before. It is this, placing supreme wisdom and supreme unwisdom at the two extremes, and myself in the exact mean between them, I am surprised to find that whether I travel towards the one extreme or the other, the credulity of those I meet increases. To put it as a paradox, whether a man be foolisher or wiser than I am, he is more credulous. I make this remark to point out to those of the great mediocre whose notice it may have escaped that credulity is not of itself shameful or contemptible, and that it depends upon the manner rather than the matter of their belief, whether they gravitate towards the sage or the reverse way. According, therefore, to the incredibility found in the following, the reader may measure as pleases him his wisdom or his unwisdom. Z. Oriel. End of preliminary note. Peregrine Oriel, my maternal uncle, was a great traveller, as his prophetical sponsors at the font seemed to have guessed he would be. Indeed, he had rummaged in the garrets and cellars of the earth with something more than ordinary diligence. But in the narrative of his travels he did not, unfortunately, preserve the judicious caution of Xenophon between the thing seen and the thing heard. And thus it came about that the town councillors of Brunsbüttel, to whom he had shown a duck-billed platypus caught alive by him in Australia, and who had him posted for an importer of artificial vermin, were not alone in their scepticism of some of the old man's tales. Thus, for instance, who could hear and believe the tale of the man-sucking tree from which he had barely escaped with his life? He called it himself more terrible than the upas, this awful plant, that rears its splendid death-shade in the central solitude of a Nubian fern-forest, sickens by its unwholesome humours all vegetation from its immediate vicinity, and feeds upon the wild beasts that, in the terror of the chase or the heat of noon, seek the thick shelter of its boughs, upon the birds that, flitting across the open space, come within the charmed circle of its power, or innocently refresh themselves from the cups of its great waxen flowers, upon even man himself, when, an infrequent prey, the savage seeks its asylum in the storm, or turns from the harsh foot-wounding sword-grass of the glade to pluck the wondrous fruit that hang plumb down among the wondrous foliage and such fruit, glorious golden ovals, great honey-drops, swelling by their own weight into pear-shaped translucencies. The foliage glistens with a strange dew that all day long drips on to the ground below, nurturing a rank growth of grasses, which shoot up in places so high that their spikes of fierce blood-fed green show far up among the deep tinted foliage of the terrible tree, and, like a jealous bodyguard, keep concealed the fearful secret of the charnel house within, and draw round the black roots of the murderous plant a decent screen of living green. Such was his description of the plant, and the other day, looking up in a botanical dictionary, I find that there is really known to naturalists a family of carnivorous plants, but I see that they are most of them very small and prey upon little insects only. My maternal uncle, however, knew nothing of this, for he died before the days of the discovery of the sundew and pitcher plants, and grounding his knowledge of the man-sucking tree simply on his own terrible experience of it, explained its existence by theories of his own. Denying the fixity of all the laws of nature except one, that the stronger shall endeavour to consume the weaker, and holding even this fixity to be itself only a means to a greater general changefulness, he argued that, since any partial distribution of the faculty of self-defence would presume an unworthy partiality in the Creator, and since the sensual instincts of beast and vegetable and manifestly analogous, the world must be as percipient as sentient throughout. 
carrying on his theory for it was something more than hypothesis with him a stage or two further he arrived at the belief that given the necessity of any imminent danger or urgent self-interest every animal or vegetable could eventually revolutionize its nature the wolf feeding on grass or nesting in trees and the violet arming herself with thorns or entrapping insects how he would ask can we claim for man the consequence of perceptions to sensations and yet deny to beasts that hear see feel smell and taste a percipient principle coexistent with their senses and if in the whole range of the animate world there is this gift of self-defence against extirpation and offence against weakness why is the inanimate world holding as fierce a struggle for existence as the other to be left defenceless and unarmed and i deny that it is the brazilian epiphyte strangles the tree and sucks out its juices the tree again to starve off its vampire parasite withdraws its juices into its roots and piercing the ground in some new place turns the current of its sap into other growths the epiphyte then drops off the dead boughs on to the fresh green sprouts springing from the ground beneath it and so the fight goes on again look at the indian peepul tree in what does the fierce yearning of its roots towards the distant well differ from the sad struggling of the camel to the oasis or of Sennacherib's army to the saving Nile. Is the sensitive plant unconscious? I have walked for miles through plains of it, and watched, till the watching almost made me afraid lest the plants should pluck up courage and turn upon me, the green carpet paling into silver grey before my feet, and fainting away all round me as I walked so strangely did i feel the influence of this universal aversion that i would have argued with the plant but what was the use if only i stretched out my hands the mere shadow of the limb terrified the vegetable to sickness shrubs crumbled up at every commencement of my speech and at my periods great sturdy-looking bushes to whose robustness i had foolishly appealed sank in pallid supplication not a leaf would keep me company a breath went forth from me that sickened life my mere presence paralyzed life and i was glad at last to come out among a less timid vegetation and to feel the resentful spear-grass retaliating on the heedlessness that would have crushed it the vegetable world however has its revenges you may keep the guinea pig in a hutch but how will you pet the basilisk the little sensitive plant in your garden amuses your children who will find pleasure also in seeking cockchafers spin round on a pin but how could you transplant a vegetable that seizes the running deer strikes down the passing bird and once taking hold of him sucks the carcass of man himself till his matter becomes as vague as his mind and all his animate capabilities cannot snatch him from the terrible embrace of god help him an inanimate tree many years ago said my uncle i turned my restless steps toward central africa and made the journey from where the senegal empties itself into the atlantic to the nile skirting the great desert and reaching nubia on my way to the eastern coast i had with me then three native attendants two of them brothers the third otona a young savage from the gaboon uplands a mere lad in his teens and one day leaving my mule with the two men who were pitching my tent for the night i went on with my gun the boy accompanying me towards a fern forest which i saw in the near distance as i approached it i found the forest was cut into two by a wide glade and seeing a small herd of the common antelope an excellent beast in the pot browsing their way along the shaded side i crept after them though ignorant of their real danger the herd was suspicious and slowly trotting along before me enticed me for a mile or more along the verge of the fern growths turning a corner i suddenly became aware of a solitary tree growing in the middle of the glade one tree alone 
It struck me at once that I had never seen a tree exactly like it before, but being intent upon venison for my supper, I looked at it only long enough to satisfy my first surprise at seeing a single plant of such rich growth flourishing luxuriantly in a spot where only the harsh fern canes seemed to thrive. The deer, meanwhile, were midway between me and the tree, and looking at them I saw they were going to cross the glade. Exactly opposite them was an opening in the forest, in which I should certainly have lost my supper. So I fired into the middle of the family, as they were filing before me. I hit a young fawn, and the rest of the herd, wheeling round in their sudden terror, made off in the direction of the tree, leaving the fawn struggling on the ground. Otona, the boy, ran forward at my order to secure it, but the little creature, seeing him coming, attempted to follow its comrades, and at a fair pace held on their course. The herd had meanwhile reached the tree, but suddenly, instead of passing under it, swerved in their career, and swept round it at some yard's distance. Was I mad, or did the plant really try to catch the deer? On a sudden I saw, or thought I saw, the tree violently agitated, and while the ferns all round were standing motionless in the dead evening air, its boughs were swayed by some sudden gust towards the herd, and swept in the force of their impulse almost to the ground. I drew my hand across my eyes, closed them for a moment, and looked again. The tree was as motionless as myself. Towards it and now close to it, the boy was running in excited pursuit of the fawn. He stretched out his hands to catch it, it bounded from his eager grasp. Again he reached forward, and again it escaped him. There was another rush forward, and the next instant boy and deer were beneath the tree, and now there was no mistaking what I saw. The tree was convulsed with motion, leaned forward, swept its thick foliaged boughs to the ground, and enveloped from my sight the pursuer and the pursued. I was within a hundred yards, and the cry of Otona from the midst of the tree came to me in all the clearness of its agony. There was then one stifled, strangling scream, and except for the agitation of the leaves where they had closed upon the boy, there was not a sign of life. I called out, Otona! No answer came. I tried to call out again, but my utterance was like that of some wild beast, smitten at once with sudden terror and its death wound. I stood there changed from all semblance of a human being. Not all the tears of earth together could have made me take my eye from the awful plant, or my foot off the ground. I must have stood thus for at least an hour, for the shadows had crept out from the forest half across the glade before that hideous paroxysm of fear left me. My first impulse, then, was to creep stealthily away, lest the tree should perceive me, but my returning reason bade me approach it. The boy might have fallen into the lair of some beast of prey, or perhaps the terrible life in the tree was that of some great serpent among its branches. Preparing to defend myself, I approached the silent tree, the harsh grass crisping beneath my feet with a strange loudness, the cicadas in the forest shrilling till the air seemed throbbing round me with waves of sound. The terrible truth was soon before me in all its awful novelty. The vegetable first discovered my presence at about fifty yards' distance. I then became aware of a stealthy motion among the thick-lipped leaves, reminding me of some wild beast slowly gathering itself up from long sleep, a vast coil of snakes in restless motion. Have you ever seen bees hanging from a bough, a great cluster of bodies, bee clinging to bee, and by striking the bough or agitating the air caused that massed life to begin sulkily to disintegrate, each insect asserting its individual right to move? And do you remember how, without one bee leaving the pensile cluster, the whole became gradually instinct with sullen life and horrid with a multitudinous motion? I came within twenty yards of it. The tree was quivering through every branch, muttering for blood, and, helpless with rooted feet, yearning with every branch towards me. 
It was that terror of the deep sea, which the men of the northern fjords dread, and which, anchored upon some sunken rock, stretches into vain space its longing arms, pellucid as the sea itself, and as relentless, maimed Polypheme, groping for his victims. Each separate leaf was agitated and hungry. Like hands, they fumbled together their fleshy palms, curling upon themselves and again unfolding, closing on each other and falling apart again. Thick, helpless, fingerless hands, rather lips or tongues than hands, dimpled closely with little cup-like hollows. I approached near and near, step by step, till I saw that these soft horrors were all of them in motion, opening and closing incessantly. I was now ten yards of the farthest reaching bow. Every part of it was hysterical with excitement. The agitation of its members was awful, sickening yet fascinating. In an ecstasy of eagerness for the food so near them, the leaves turned upon each other. Two meeting would suck together face to face with a force that compressed their joint thickness to a half, thinning the two leaves into one, now grappling in a volute like a double shell, writhing like some green worm, and at last faint with the violence of the paroxysm, would slowly separate, falling apart as leeches gorged drop off the limbs. A sticky dew glistened in the dimples, welled over, and trickled down the leaf. The sound of it dripping from leaf to leaf made it seem as if the tree was muttering to itself. The beautiful golden fruit as they swung here and there were clutched now by one leaf and now by another held for a moment close, enfolded from the sight, and then as suddenly released. Here a large leaf, vampire-like, had sucked out the juices of a smaller one. It hung limp and bloodless, like a carcass of which the weasel has tired. I watched the terrible struggle, till my starting eyes, strained by intense attention, refused their office, and I can hardly say what I saw, but the tree before me seemed to have become a live beast. Above me I felt conscious was a great limb, and each of its thousand clammy hands reached downwards towards me, fumbling. It strained, shivered, rocked, and heaved. It flung itself about in despair. The boughs tantalized to madness with the presence of flesh were tossed to this side and to that in the agony of a frantic desire. The leaves were wrung together as the hands of one driven to madness by sudden misery. I felt the vile dew spurting from the tense veins fall upon me. My clothes began to give out a strange odor. The ground I stood on glistened with animal juices. Was I bewildered by terror? Had my senses abandoned me in my need, I know not, but the tree seemed to me to be alive. Leaning over towards me, it seemed to be pulling up its roots from the softened ground, and to be moving towards me, a mountainous monster with myriad lips, mumbling together for my life was upon me. Like one who desperately defends himself from imminent death, I made an effort for life and fired my gun at the approaching horror. To my dizzied senses the sound seemed far off, but the shock of the recoil partially recalled me to myself, and starting back I reloaded. The shots had torn their way into the soft body of the great thing. The trunk, as it received the wound, shuddered, and the whole tree was struck with a sudden quiver. A fruit fell down, slipping from the leaves, now rigid with swollen veins as from carven foliage. Then I saw a large arm slowly droop, and without a sound it was severed from the juice-fattened bowl, and sank down softly, noiselessly, through the glistening leaves. I fired again, and another vile fragment was powerless, dead. At each discharge the terrible vegetable yielded a life. Piecemeal I attacked it, killing here a leaf and there a branch. My fury increased with the slaughter till, when my ammunition was exhausted, the splendid giant was left a wreck, as if some hurricane had torn through it. On the ground lay heaped together the fragments, struggling, rising and falling, gasping. Over them drooped in dying languor a few stricken boughs, while upright in the midst stood, dripping at every joint, the glistening trunk. My continued firing had brought up one of my men on my mule. 
He dared not, so he told me, come near me, thinking me mad. I had now drawn my hunting knife, and with this was fighting, with the leaves, yes, but each leaf was instinct with a hard life, and more than once I felt my hand entangled for a moment, and seized as if by sharp lips. Ignorant of the presence of my companion, I made a rush, forward over the fallen foliage, and with a last paroxysm of frenzy, drove my knife up to the handle into the soft bowl, and slipping on the fast congealing sap, fell exhausted and unconscious among the still panting leaves. My companions carried me back to the camp, and after vainly searching for Otona, awaited my return to consciousness. Two or three hours elapsed before I could speak, and several days before I could approach the terrible thing. My men would not go near it. It was quite dead, for as we came up a great-billed bird, with gaudy plumage that had been securely feasting on the decaying fruit, flew up from the wreck. We removed the rotting foliage, and there, among the dead leaves still limp with juices, and piled round the roots, we found the ghastly relics of many former meals, and, its last nourishment, the corpse of little Otona. To have removed the leaves would have taken too long, so we buried the body as it was with a hundred vampire leaves still clinging to it. Such as nearly as I remember it was my uncle's story of the man-eating tree. End of the man-eating tree by Phil Robinson.